Um, afternoon, everyone. I'm um, going to talk this afternoon about um, how we can achieve sort of better searching for our applications uh, using Elasticsearch. Um, my name's Richard Miller. I am a software engineer at Sensio Labs uh, UK. Um, in the UK, I'm, uh, I live in Sheffield, and um, you can find me on Twitter at Mr. Underscore R underscore Miller. The slightly awkward uh, thing there. Um, so, I guess the first thing is, um, you know, why why should we worry about getting search working on websites? And uh, sort of fairly obviously, I guess that um, for a lot of sites, and particularly say e-commerce, but for lots of other types of sites as well, the search is kind of the main um, tool that uh, users use to navigate the website. So, um, a lot of you know, you get you get to the site and immediately sort of start searching for the product that you want. Um, so, to make that you actually usable for users as well, we need to make sure that it works well, so that um, they can find relevant results. They're not finding um, finding things they're not interested in, and we can help them out if they make mistakes, if there's typos and things like that, by s making suggestions and things like this. Um, okay, so. The, for this talk, I'm going to use an example of um, a site for finding uh, places to eat, so finding restaurants, cafes, etc., um, by letting users search for those in various ways. So I'm going to start by sort of going through some of the things you might want from that in the form of a few user stories, um, and we're going to sort of start by assuming that so we've built, we've got a database for the site, we're using MySQL, and at first, you know, we're going to look at can we just carry on using MySQL for all the search, because that's going to be the easiest thing to do. We don't have to mess about installing another ser um, elastic search and things like this. Okay, So the first thing we want is just basic search. We want to be able to search for somewhere to eat, get relevant results, and see them ordered. So the first choice would be just to be ordered by how relevant they are to our results. So the things that seem most connected should be at the top. So that shouldn't be a problem, I guess, in MySQL. We can you know, search for those. <coughs> um, and for this site as well, we also want to, um, we have reviews for the restaurants that um, the users can leave, so, and they're in another table. So we're going to want to kind of join across to that table and include um, results based on matches to the reviews as well as just to save a name and a description. Um, but you know, we can join tables, that shouldn't be a problem. Okay, um, and another thing then, yeah, we want to see results for similar words, so not just exact matches to things that we type in as a user. You want to be able to get, you know, type a word and not miss the results just because a slight variation of the word is in the um, is in the actual text that we're searching. Yeah, we could probably do that; shouldn't be a problem. Um, and we might also want to not just search by um, so order the results by the most relevant, but also I, if we know the user's location, um, if they're using their phone, provided a location, and we want to be able to search, order them by the distance them from their current location, or perhaps let them provide a different location and order them that way. Oh, it should be possible, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and we want to help them out if they typo. If they put something in that's not quite right, then we might want to say, well, you know, here's some suggestions of things that you might mean based on the text that's, that's there. So helpful suggestions that will actually return them results. Um, you know, well, Google does it. Other sites do that. shouldn't be a problem. I'm not quite sure how to do that in MySQL, but, you know, we'll figure it out. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> And we also want to be able to kind of help them out so when they start typing, you know, you do a bit of Ajax stuff and start suggesting things straight away. So not waiting until they've put the whole search in, hit enter, waited for that to load. We're going to, you know, as soon as they start typing, want to sort of start making suggestions of things that, that might do. For them. Nah, should be okay. We want to let them filter their results. So once they get searches, then maybe have some tags and let them say just you know just once for that tag or just those tags. Um, yep. So I mean that's definitely not going to be a problem if we're using MySQL. We can just you know adjust the query to filter on those um, tags, add an extra where clause. 
And we also want to kind of, once they get to a particular result, sort of show them similar things. So, you know, the kind of typical, I guess, e-commerce thing, but, you know, like other similar products, that kind of thing. So we want other similar places to eat. So um, we should be able to do that, yeah. And one last one, which has been thrown in, not by, not for the purposes of the sort of person searching, but usually to keep the sort of people who run restaurants happy. For some reason, they tend to only ever have their menus in PDF form. So we want that they would like to be able to upload their menus and have that influence of search results without having to type it all out again. So we want to be able to upload and index the content of PDFs, which mm, is a bit trickier, so I'm not quite sure how we're going to achieve that. But so you know we'll stick with MySQL for now because we can definitely do some of it and we can worry about the harder things towards the end. So you know we'll get the easier stuff out of the way. Say. So, basic search first. Just want to find them some results and give them back in order. <coughs> so we'll start simplistic, very simple way. Just going to select things from our uh, eateries table where the name is like the search term. If we have multiple search terms already, we're going to have to make it a bit more complicated. Split those up and want to say whether the na name is like the first term or the second term. And obviously, there might be multiple terms. People can search with big long phrases sometimes. And yeah, so it's starting to get a bit more complicated. But we're going to have to deal with multiple fields as well. So um, we don't just want to search on a name. We're also going to, at this point, just have it in a description as well. So we're going to end up with something more like this. It's already sort of spreading enough to go across two slides. So, um, And we're going to have to put various things in to kind of generate this on the fly because of the dealing with multiple search terms. Um, and then the other thing on our thing that we need to do is this ordering by relevance. So if we're just using MySQL and this basic kind of just um, looking for those things, then how do we decide which are the most relevant? How do we know that of all the ones that match, which one had the most matches or matched in more fields or on both terms, if it's multiple terms and things like this? It's not something that we can particularly easily achieve just with queries like that. Um, yeah, so the order's going to be a bit of an issue. And we also want them to be re relevant. So one of the things that can cause you to get irrelevant results is um, common words in the um, search term and in the text. So if we've got things like the, with, be, but, it, a common sort of, of these um, stop words, so words we want to remove from the search and not have it influence our results. And we also might want a custom one because in this, um, for this particular site, food is going to be an irrelevant, so everything's about food, but so people might still say, like, I want to, you know, search for Thai food, and we don't want to kind of just give irrelevant results because it also said food in something. So we're going to be able to want to remove those words and also, you know, add to the ones that we remove. So, okay, we're not going to get very far with still sticking with MySQL as it um, normal things, but we could move to full text search, so that's going to solve some of these problems. So if we use full text search, it makes our queries a bit simpler, um, look a bit simpler. It has uh, stop words that you can configure so we can deal with the um, common words and it'll also deal with the ordering for us as well. So it's all, because it's um, set up for search, it's not just going to return things, it will actually deal with ordering it by relevance. Yeah, so, okay, well, so let's move to using full text search. That should be able to deal with all those things, what, uh, what was left to do. Um, well, we wanted to join to relevant reviews. So, you know, you can left join onto those. Shouldn't be a problem. I think you can do that in full text search. Um, and we also wanted to look for results for similar words. So we might have grilled, grilling, grills, and grill all in there. And we don't want to kind of stop, um, say that if someone searches for grilling, we don't get results for grilled. Um, but unfortunately, this is not something that uh, full text search can deal with out of the box. So that's another thing that's going to cause us a problem. 
and also um, we wanted to order close to the location. Now you can do sort of geo stuff in MySQL, but it's not much fun in my experience trying to uh, um, work out, work with the queries and work out distances and things in it. So again, you'd end up with you know some pretty almighty and no doubt quite slow queries. Okay, so um, what we can do then to um, deal with all of these issues is move from searching our database directly to using Elasticsearch. So we're going to use a, um, so a specific search tool for this, um, search server. So, and in this case, Elasticsearch. So we can then keep our database for the of the data for the relevant um, stuff, and also put copies of it all into Elasticsearch, designed and um, specifically set up for our search needs. Okay, so <laughs> Elasticsearch is a distributed, schemaless, document-oriented, Lucene-based search engine with a REST API. So that's quite a lot of, uh, well, I guess buzzwords even in there. So um, we'll kind of work through and have a look at what. Um, like what they all mean in practice for Elasticsearch. Okay, so if you do use Elasticsearch on things, you're in pretty good company. It's uh, proud of search on GitHub now, Stack Overflow. Um, I get less relevant here, but in the UK, we've um, a lot of our the government websites have recently relaunched and are using it. Uh, Foursquare, SoundCloud, and various others. <coughs> so. If you want to install it for development purposes, then all you really need to do is grab it from, grab the latest version from the Elasticsearch site, unzip it, move into the directory, and run bin Elasticsearch, and that's it. It's up and running. Um, for production, you're going to want to do a bit more than that. And, but um, just for, if you want to play about with it, just installing it for development purposes is as easy as that. Um, and once it's up and running, by default, it's going to run on port 9200, so you can um, start accessing it straight away on that. Um, now, it uh, uses Lucene, so it's a Java application. It runs on um, so Lucene under the hood, but it adds all this additional stuff we're going to talk about, the REST API, the dis um, distributable, and things like this on top of it. So once it's installed, first thing we can do is just check that it's there. So use curl to um, just get localhost 9200, and it will send back a JSON document with a bit of information for us, uh, saying that it's there. And you can see it's based on this version is based on Lucene 4.4. Um, and it also chooses some fairly, uh, just picks <laughs> some fairly random names for us for the uh, decks as well. Okay, so um, a couple of terminology things that we're going to talk. Um, so, uh, unsurprisingly, with search, so instead of databases, we have an index, um, and you can have multiple indexes per instance of the server, as just as you can with multiple databases on MySQL. Don't have tables within an index. You have types, so you can have different types of document um, and search across those. And yeah, we say it's. Uh, they're referred to as documents and not records as well. Okay, so distributor part, it's called Elasticsearch essentially because it's designed for sort of um, flexible scaling across um, multiple in instances. <coughs> so when you create an index, by default it's um, actually split into five shards, um, but if you're only running one instance, you can't really tell because all the shards are located on the same one. If we add fire up some more instances, then um, providing they're kind of using the same cluster name and in the same and able to talk to each other, they'll automatically find each other and split those shards across each of the servers. So if we had three instances, the shards might get split out like this. Um, and if you are again playing about in development, if you just keep running bin Elasticsearch it will keep firing up more instances of it on progressively higher port, so 9201, 9202, etc. Um, the actual default settings are slightly more complicated than that in that 
you have five shards, but it's also set up to have one replica set as well. So you'll actually get something like this if you just leave the, use the default settings and fire up three instances. We'd end up with all the shards sort of split across, but two copies of each one. Okay. Um, so it's document oriented with a REST API. So in practice, this means that if we're just using curl to access it, then you can uh, post JSON documents to it, and that's how they're indexed. So uh, we're going to post to localhost again. And then an index is the first part of your URL, a member type is the second. So, um, so then we send, yeah, send a JSON document to that get back another J, uh, JSON response that looks something like this. Um, they're not particularly readable like this, but with any of these, um, any queries that you sort of send over curl to it, you can append uh, pretty equals true to it, and it will send back something more like this. So I'm not going to include those in the slides, but it's worth yeah, just remembering for all of those sort of things that you get more readable responses using that. OK, so we posted it, and you can see, created it in the Eatly index and eatery's type, and it generated an ID automatically for us as well. If we want to keep our own IDs, which is pretty useful if you're trying to, if you've got the database of content and you want to sync it, keep it up to date with Elasticsearch, then you probably want to use the same kind of keys that you do in the database. So if instead of posting, we put and include an ID at the end of the URI, then same thing, except it will use our ID, so um, instead of generating a random one. And then we can also get retrieve the documents with get. So if we ask for that back, we'll get a bit of information, index type again, the version, and the actual source, the original document that we indexed back to us. And we can update with put. Um, so if we put a slightly different version to that, again, to the, uh, with the ID, then it'll update it. You can actually see it returns and it's now on version 2. And if we get it again, then we can see that it's changed. But when you use put, it will actually completely replace the document with the one you send, not just kind of um, increment different fields. And we can delete as well. Same thing again, but delete this time. And if we ask for it, we can see we just get back a thing saying that it doesn't exist this time. It is a search engine. That's the whole point of why we're using it. So um, we want to be able to search across these things, not just get them by ID. So we can do this again at the same uh, URL, except this time we're going to use this uh, endpoint of underscore search, so index type underscore search, and then the simplest way of querying it is just to send this Q equals, um, and you can either send just a term, or in this case we're specifying we're just searching in the name field. And then we get back the results, so a bit of information, how long did it take, how many shards did it hit, total hits of one in this case, if any added one document, and um, the actual source again within that of the um, each hit. So as well as searching one type, there's a few things you can do just with the URL to search across different things. So if we want to search, we've got multiple types. So if we split it into cafes and pubs, say, then you can search on multiple types with the comma. So cafes and pubs, we can search every type in an index by just missing the type out, multiple indexes, all indexes um, for certain types. And if you want to search just absolutely everything, then you can search. If you just underscore search af after the instance, then you're going to search every index, every type. OK, um, and it, it's schemaless. Sort of. So, so far, we've just been firing documents at it. We didn't even create the index or the type or anything first. They just created on the fly as soon as you said something to that. And we didn't have to kind of specify a schema for the individual documents. Again, it just gets created on the fly, and Elasticsearch will guess from the type of the data that you send what type of data it is. 
Um, and that's great, again, for messing about development, having and um, playing about with it. But in practice, you're going to want to kind of be able to specify these things a bit more and not always just use the default settings. So again, we can use the REST interface to send settings to it. So if we're creating, um, so instead of just letting the index be created, we can create it directly and send settings to that. So in this case, we're sort of controlling the number of shards and the number of replicas. Um, and then we can also update the mapping, um, well, the scheme or the mapping, as it's called, for Elasticsearch. So the reason we're going to do this, then, is for this story, where uh, oh, our first one again, um, we're going to make the results more relevant by saying that the name field is more important than the description. So if something's in the name, it should come, it should be considered a better match than it just the same term appearing in a description. And um, so one of the ways we can do that is instead of just firing the things off, documents off, we can specify a mapping. So we tell for the type what the properties are that we're going to map. So name, um, the type is string, and in this case, you're going to add a boost of 1.5 to the name. So whenever you search, the name's always going to come back as being considered more important in the ordering. And we also wanted to do that join onto relevant reviews. Um, but rather than actually having to actually join, because we can nest documents. So we can just say, when we set our mapping as well, we want the name, the description. We're also going to have reviews. And they're going to have the properties themselves of review and reviewer. So, um, so that Elasticsearch is now expecting us to send additional nested objects. And we can do that when we post to it. So we set the name and description as before, and also send an array of reviews. So we can just store that all in the same in a single document and not worry about the um, having to join across anything. And if you do want to search specifically on one of those fields rather than just across everything, then you can use this sort of dot syntax to dig down, say, reviews dot review. So you're just searching the review field of all the reviews for a document. OK, and we also wanted to see results for similar words. So um, we can do this. We have a quick look at what happens. So when you store document, the actual text in it gets um, analyzed, so it gets split up into individual sort of tokens and various processes happen to this. Um, and then the same thing happens with your query, and it's those tokens that Elasticsearch uses to match rather than actually searching through that source. So you get something like this. So the standard tokenizer, we say, um, so we s if this review was sent, um, then it gets split up like this into these tokens. So basically, splits on white space and uh, punctuation between words, not um, like the apostrophes within Kant and Jeff's. Um, there's a few of us, so white space tokenizer just as the white space, so we end up leaving in the punctuation. Um, so you've, yeah, got the exclamation mark on the end of excellent. And we can also use this letter tokenizer that just splits on everything that's not um, alphanumeric characters, so that you end up with even splitting up can and can't and Jeff, Jeff's into Jeff and S. So there's a few different um, tokenizers for these, and there's also sort of language-specific ones because it doesn't work the same in every language, and particularly true of some of the filters where, um, which we'll get to in a minute. So as well as so, as well as a single tokenizer, you then run through multiple filters. So, you want to lowercase it, um, so that we can lowercase the query as well, and we don't end up missing results because of mismatches in case. We can add the stop filter to get rid of those stop words I was talking about. So we've lost um, we've lost the and it things like that. And then the bit that's going to help us match on those um, similar words. Um, is we can use a stemmer filter, which reduces the um, words down to a common stem. So really is what it's actually become, real, really with an I, and enjoy gets split down. And uh, excellent goes to, it, to Excel. So, so if we had excelling, it would go to Excel as well, or really um, things like um, we'll get yeah, it gets reduced. So if we do the same with our query, so that those, the token, those tokens that are getting matched, then we'll start to get results for similar you know, words with the same stem, not just exact matches. 
Um, and again, that's one of the ones where you can configure it to um, for different languages because obviously the stems are different, um, different depending on what language it's in. We have to say what analyzer we're going to use. So if an analyzer is a uh, building sort of combination of tokenizers um, and filters. So the snowball one um, uses a standard tokenizer, lowercase as it, but also gives you um, a, diff a stem of its um, uses a particular uh, algorithm called snowball. Um, so we need to say that we're going to use that when we create the index, or you can update it later to say, name it, say we're using a snowball analyzer, and then in our mapping we can specify which one we're going to use for a particular field, um, as well as having a default one for everything. If we want a custom one, so we wanted to miss food, and there's probably other ones, uh, words as well, then slightly more complicated, so say it's a custom type, which tokenizer we want to use and which filters we want to use, and then we can create a custom stop filter that's the stop type, but specify the stop words we want to use rather than using the default list. So once that's set up on the index, same thing again, we just specify we want to use our custom analyzer um, for the description field. Okay, so we looked at pretty simple queries before, but there's um, a JSON DC DSL for writing more complex queries. So our simple query was pretty much um, maps to this. So it's uh, a match query. We're just matching on the name. Specifying the field is um, is burger, and then but what we can now do is start to add extra things. So by default, you're going to use it's going to use or to decide. So Things will match on burger or on bar. But you can specify, say, one of the settings. We can say, yeah, we want to say and. So you can start to build up more comp um, We want burger and bar to appear. So you can start to build up more complex queries. Um, so match is like just the most common and sort of basic query. There's quite a lot of others. Um, I think there's like 40 odd when I last looked. Um, so another one is multi match. So it lets us search across multiple fields um, without having to actually specify a query for each one, so it's pretty much the same, except we specify fields as an array. And we can also boost um, things this way, so per query rather than when we index, so this sort of caret and two on the end of name says that we want name to be treated as twice as important as the other fields when ordering. <coughs> um, as well as queries, then um, you can filter the results, so we wanted to allow people to filter, maybe based on tags. So um, if we actually add some tags to our document, so we update it, adding this array of tags. And then we can add a filter to remove um, results based on those. So we've got a filter, a terms filter, which matches um, to the tags field, with um, any, so any of these values matching it. And we're going to wrap it in an additional filter, the not filter, which based so it will remove them rather than only including those values. So with both the queries and the filters, you can kind of nest them and use a Boolean sort of AND filters and ALL filters to combine different filters and different queries to start to build up complex queries. Um, a lot of the queries and filters do the same sort of thing. So there's terms queries there's and the term filter. So the reason for sort of choosing one or the other is that you need to use a query if um, the query affects the, the results, the ordering of the results, and filters don't. So um, the query needs anything that's going to, like the actual terms that we search for, we want to affect the results. So we need to use a query for those. With the tags, we just wanted to remove them. So a filter is better for this because um, it's quicker because it just decides is it in or is it out, not how does the score work. And it's also cacheable. So Elasticsearch can cache the results of that. So filters are more performant. Um, so whenever you don't actually need it to affect the, the ordering, then the filter's a better choice. OK, um, we also wanted to be able to do a different search where we made the orders um, based on location. So we can do this fairly easily by 
We need to add the location. So in our mapping, we're going to add a location with the type geo point and send that location information when we uh, update our document. And then here, we're not actually using it to affect the results, particularly although we can filter on the geo points and things to say it must be within a certain distance. What we want to do here is just change the sort order. So as well as query and filter in the JSON thing, you can have a sort section and specify what you're searching on, so what type of sort it is. So in this case, it's a geo distance search sort based on the location. Um, so, so it's pretty straightforward to do compared to like if we were trying to do this in MySQL, it would have been quite a lot of complications around the query and doing this, but Elasticsearch lets us do it pretty, pretty easily. <coughs> um, once you start building up these complex queries, then trying to do it all using curl at the command line gets pretty complicated. Um, doesn't get much fun because got to keep, try and keep track of those. There's a few useful tools for this. There's a Chrome extension called Sense, um, which you can issue queries and get the results from. Um, it's quite useful. And it also it provides sort of auto-completion for um, different query and filter types as well. And there's also a plugin for Elasticsearch itself called Head, which once you've installed, runs on the Elasticsearch um, instance, so lo local host. Um, 9,200 if you're just developing um, at plugins underscore head, I believe. And that gives you a similar thing with being able to issue queries, but it also gives you information um, on like where, which shards are on which instance and things like this. Um, and also lets you browse as well as searching the um, contents of the index. Okay, so for a PHP application, though, we're not going to want to kind of deal with writing the um, JSON and making uh, specific curl requests ourselves. Um, so there's a library that you can use for that called Elastica, um, which provides sort of deals with the actual sending, you know, the request to and from the server and wraps it all into a sort of object-oriented API. Um, it's not the only uh, PHP client. There's also a couple of Sherlock and Elasticsearch. And as of about a month ago, there's now an official client from from Elasticsearch themselves. Uh, but um, and the idea with that is that they want to make a client for all lots of different languages that has essentially the same API. But it's a little bit more basic in that when we get on to we well, can see that our base queries we're writing we can um, put together using objects. But with the official client you just end up with a big nested array. So um, personally I'd still use Elastica over it for now. Okay, so you can install it with Composer. The versioning actually matches to Elasticsearch, so 0.90.2 works with that version of Elasticsearch, and then it's just got an extra minor um, thing just for Elastica at the end. Okay, so create a client pretty easily. New client. Um, you have to pass, back, pass any extra options if it's not running on localhost and 9200. Then we can get our indexes um, from the client, and then from an index we can get a type. Once we've got a type, we can do things like adding documents. Um, so it's an Elastic. Elastic has a document object that we create. If you want to post it and have it generate the ID for us, then the first argument can be null, um, and then an array of the data. If you want to use the put and specify your own ID, then um, can specify the ID as the first argument. And then there's various uh, various other useful sort of um, similar things. So we can add a um, collection of documents in one go, and that uses a different kind of bulk update in the background rather than making a curl request for every single one. Uh, we can get document by ID, we can delete by ID, we can delete by passing a full document, and we can delete the whole type if we want to for some reason. And you, there's a search method that you can use to issue those basic searches. So if you just put in text, it's going to search kind of across all the fields. Um, and you can limit the number of results as well, the second argument, as well as just getting a count and not the results, which is, um, so those sort of last two are pretty useful if you need to do paginated searching. So 
So all the sort of Elastic search queries have object versions in Elastica, so for our multi-match query, we can uh, create the multi-match object, set the query and the fields on it using its methods, and then we need to wrap that in an overall query. So in our JSON, we always had query, and then whichever queries were nested in that, and that's equi the equivalent of that in the object. And once we've got that overall query, we can set the filters on it. So again, we can use objects for those, the Boolean not filter that's wrapping a terms filter. And then once all that's done, we can pass it to that same search method. Um, so you can pass these sort of fully formed objects as well as just simple text queries to it. Okay, um, yeah, and we can also do things like setting those index values and the um, index settings and the mapping from Elastica as well. So uh, you can set up the set of a mapping. So you'd probably want to be doing this as an initialization job when you're sort of first getting stuff from the database and setting up an initial index. Um, then you can do, do all that mapping and things with Elastica itself. Okay, so if we go back to our user stories, you can see which of those we've sort of managed to sort out. So we're now seeing relevant results because we are getting rid of the stop um, words, and we can order them by relevance as well pretty easily with what well, Elasticsearch will just do it for us. And we nested our reviews into it, so we're going to get results based on the reviews. And we should see results now for similar words because of using the stammer filter to... Um, make sure we're only indexing on the uh, split down sort of stem of a word. And we can search for somewhere to eat near them by using the geo point and the geo, uh, uh, geo for, um, ordering. Okay, um, and we s started being able to let them use this filter their results, so we can add a filter to it, that's easy enough. But what isn't gonna be very useful if we can't actually tell them what to filter on. So if we have those tags, we want to be able to say in the results, these are the tags that are there and how many things there are for those so that you can then make a more informed decision as to um, which tag to filter on. So we can do this pretty easily, again with Elasticsearch. So we create a, f a facet. So Elasticsearch has um, this idea of facets. It um, so we're going to do it for term, basically, or we're going to say, for the tags field, tell me how many um, results there are for each tag for the query. So we create the facet with um, an object again, tell it which field, the number that we want, so we're going to limit to just the top 10, so and ignore the others. And then we add that to our query. So we're running the same query, but just adding this additional facet information. Um, and then when we get the query, the results back, we can ask the result set for those facets and loop through them. Um, well, in this case, we're just going to dump them out but to make use of that and then use those, provide those to the user so that they know, in this case, that there's four things tagged with Thai, eight tagged with Italian, etc. Um, and then they can choose to say, I just want to see the Italian ones, for instance. Okay, uh, one of our other things then, we wanted to view the details of similar things to our results. So once we've actually got a particular document that um, we're looking at, you can actually just ask the type for more like this. So there's a more like this method and there's an underlying um, matching endpoint. So instead of using the search endpoint, if you're actually using curl, you use it's a more like this, I think it's underscore MLT. Um, and you pass it a document well, you pass it an actual ID. So what Elastica does is you pass it a document that gets the ID out of it. So if you haven't got a full document, you can just kind of cheat and just pass it a document with just an ID rather than having to go to the Elasticsearch, get the document, and then go back again. Um, so when you do that, it's just going to do its own kind of comparison by looking at the searching on the fields of one document to find similar documents. So, um, so we can implement that functionality with just one extra line of code.
We also wanted to be able to upload PDFs and make those searchable, which is again something that Elasticsearch can um, do for us. It can't actually do it out of the box. You do have to install the plugin um, that adds this functionality, and it uses it based on the Apache Tika library. Once you've installed the uh, plugin, this new type, so instead of string and things that we had before, you've got an attachment type. Um, and then once that's in there, we can just, once we're creating our document, Elastic document, can just add the file path to it. Um, and that's it. Once we've added that file, it'll send it off to Elasticsearch and it'll um, pull all this, sort of index all the um, words from the PDF itself and make that available to our search results. Uh, so behind the scenes, it's kind of doing, Elastic deals with some of the stuff for you and it's basically for encoding it and all this sort of stuff, but um, from an NG sort of developer point of view, you just need to call add file on the document, so it's pretty straightforward, really. Um, okay, so the last few things that we wanted to add to it as well. We wanted to get did you mean type suggestions, so when someone uh, typos something, um, we want to be able to suggest things to them. So we can do that. At the moment, um, Elasticos, this is, so this functionality was new in one of the most recent updates to Elasticsearch, and it's not actually supported directly by Elastica, but we can sort of drop down and create queries um, as an array rather than using the object. So there isn't a matching object for it, but if we just move to kind of creating our query as an array and then add this suggest section into it, we can say the text that we want to check and which, and which field that we want to check it against. So in this case, we're just limiting it to name, but we could search cost name, description, etc. Um, and then we get a query back. Again, because it's not particularly supported, we have to kind of dig down into the actual data that came back f for us and dump that out. Well, if we dump it out, we can see it comes back. So, right, so we sent burger spelled with an E, and we're getting back the suggestion that maybe you meant burger. So we can then decide what to do with that, whether to display it to the end user, or if it's if we're getting, say, no results and a suggestion for something else, we could automatically rerun the query and give them those results and sort of let them know that that's what's happened. Okay, and the other thing was that we wanted to be able to kind of start making suggestions as they type. So, and um, sort of fire off um, AJAX request. So you've been able to do this for quite a while in Elasticsearch, but by using a different sort of analyzer to the ones we were looking at before that lets you kind of search for prefixes and words rather than um, rather than sort of whole matches. So yeah, so that's been there for a while, but doing that means that you're actually kind of going off every sort of key press you're going off actually doing a full search. And um, so in the most recent version, they've actually added in a particular way of doing this that dumps all the things for that into memory, so it's much faster than it would be for doing it the old sort of way of using the prefix uh, queries. And again, it's not supported yet by, um, by Elastica directly, but we can still sort of add it in by um, setting properties on the mapping of this completion type. So we're going to suggest names with completion type. We're going to add the same thing as our name to that field. And then in our query, um, and then um, we're making a different type of query this time. So it's uh, not actually going to the search endpoint, it goes elsewhere. So we set it up again as an array because there's no object for it yet to say, but we're looking for completions on which field we want to complete on. And because of the, there is no support directly for that endpoint yet, we also need to get Elastica to, well, drop down the level in Elastica and actually specifically issue the, in the request against the index and specify that it's the suggest endpoint and the type of request in our query. OK, 
Okay, and again, once we get the data back from the response, we can, sort of, if we have a look in there, we get back in a sort of array, um, but we can dig the results out of. So in this case, I, can't, I searched just on J, and we're getting back the Jeff's burger joint as expected. Okay, so, so I was sort of covering of quite a lot of the how Elasticsearch works and some of the things it can do for us. So as well as um, there's a lot more queries than we looked at that I looked at here. Um, so for all sorts of different uses and things, so you can do like geo searches within a particular boundary and things like this. Um, and as well as those sort of different queries and token and tokenizers and all these things that can help to kind of get better search results. There are various other things as well that are uh, good to worth investigating. So you can actually run sort of scripts against things. So if you've got particular, I don't know, like the sort needs to do things that you can't achieve just with basic boosting, then you can do use scripts for that. Um, there's also a thing called the <laughs> percolator, which lets you index queries instead of documents. So what you do is you set up the queries that you want to index and then you ask it if a and then you can say, does this document match any of those queries? Um, as opposed to, here's a query, do which documents match it? So you can use that for kind of having a load of different queries up and whenever you index a new document, you can find out, you know, did it match these? If it does, then I need to take this action and things like that. Um, it's also, concept of the river, which there's various things that let you get data from different sources like Mongo straight into Elasticsearch without um, having to do anything um, in the application itself. And as well as kind of use for searches like that, then another kind of big use for it is um, using it to kind of analyze data rather than just sort of search on it. So with things like the facets, there's like histogram ones and things like this that you can use to kind of um, get sort of data analysis type results. and it was being used for, well, it is being used for Logstash, um, a log analysis tool, which has actually now sort of come into the Elasticsearch company as well, so they're helping to develop that further as well, um, which is a which is, um, pretty cool thing for just, yeah, you throw all your logs at it and you can do all sorts of searches and find what's in there. Okay, so... Cool. So, um, yeah. Uh, any questions? Pardon? Oh, by Tanya. <laughs> 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 Um, okay, uh, I'd like to ask you uh, how big your data set is? Um, have you, uh, how uh, much data have you been storing and processing with Elasticsearch? Um, I think the biggest thing we did wasn't massive, but it was, I think it's about a million records or so, or documents. Um, but that just, and that ran quite easily off just one instance. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, does Elasticsearch have any compressed storage? Because I was considering it for, you know, uh, for storing logs, and it takes about 30 times as much space as compressed logs on disk, so, well, it's a lot. Does it have any compression built in? Um, I don't know off the top of my head, to be honest. Okay. Um, there is stuff you can do to kind of adjust exactly what it stores as well, which um, I guess if you actually need the full document, it's, then it's not going to help. You can kind of say, don't store all the things, just kind of keep the ID and tell me which IDs match and things like that, but which can help for big rec record sets, but perhaps not in this case, mm -hmm. I guess. Okay, thanks. Uh, how fast is it? Can you compare it to another um, engines, of such engines, like um, Sphinx or something? I'm not sure if the actual 
benchmarks for this, but in my experience, it's pretty fast, and it's fast enough for you know GitHub and the like. So, um, but exact benchmarks, I'm not sure of. Hello, uh, I'd like to ask uh, if I have one node of Elasticsearch server and it goes down, uh, what are the chances I lose data and uh, do I have to re-index uh, any parts of, of this uh, database? It's like, um, you wouldn't need to, well, if you lost it altogether eventually, but if you use the replication across multiple instances as well, then it will recover from that. Um, if you don't, um, if you don't have some form of replication built in, like just sharding, then it will cause a problem if, you know, if one of them goes down. You can also set it up just in terms of data loss, then you can set it up to automatically snapshot everything um, to like S3 storage and things like that fairly straightforward, in a fairly straightforward way. Uh, I think it might sound a weird question, but uh, have you ever experimented uh, with uh, completely replacing a database with Elasticsearch? Um, I don't know. It's not a weird question. In that For example? Not, no, not in practice, but I've, it is something we thought about on the basis that essentially it is a document store and you can back it up, you can have replicas. Okay, so for example, uh, we have a... Mm, simple uh, knowledge base application what do you think uh, it will be reasonable to replace whole database and uh, st store all documents inside elasticsearch um i think they themselves don't recommend using it as your only data source i certainly think it's i can't it seems completely plausible to do it to me but i wouldn't like to <laughs> Say that you should do it um, if it all goes wrong. So, but yeah, I can't. It's, it is essentially a data store with the search built on. So, um, it's quite possible. I mean, we some, um, use it to kind of not just for the search element of things, but almost as a kind of denormalized front end for the front ends of sites. So you've got about the database backing it still, but actually use that as the main kind of. Um, think repository of stuff for the site, but not gone as far as getting rid of the database altogether yet. Hi, Richard. Uh, Hi. Thanks for a great talk. I would like to ask you about the scores. Uh, so, you show that for some, uh, let's say, uh, results, there there is a field like score, and are there some custom function I can write on my own? For, for I I I give you a example what I'm thinking about. I'm uh, we we like to have a portal for searching for flats and there's like price uh, square meters and location and I would like to have a custom function so for me the price is more important so put the cheapest uh, on top but for me the location is more important there's is there an option to write some custom function um, yeah there is there's a few things where you can avoid going as far as doing that with um, kind of sorting out what what it considers more important um, and it just you know, with the boosts, and you can, if you're searching across things, you can use Dismax, um, which looks at making sure, you know, does if, but if you've got multiple search terms, it appears in both fields and things like this. But you can use the sort of scripting to actually script the kind of sort order, which can be quite useful for, um, so yeah, we've, u we've had to use it for things. So where you, you don't want to reorder on something, but you want to kind of push it, push certain things up a bit so that you can kind of say, so you could do something like saying, I want to order based on it being cheap, but I want to kind of boost the nearer things up the up a bit sort of thing. So yeah, you can use the scripts for that, but um, it, it takes quite a bit of fiddling about to actually get it to kind of produce the results that you want. Um, and one thing as well, there's an explain endpoint that you can send queries to, and that'll actually give you information about how it decided on the um, the score and stuff like that, which can be quite useful for sort of debugging that kind of thing. Mm, okay, uh, I got another question. Uh, could you please uh, tell me if it's a, a fundamentally stupid idea to store, uh, for example, um, binary attachments as uh, sub documents in Elasticsearch? No, uh, don't index, index them at all, don't search over them, just store them along a document. Is it fundamentally stupid or does it have a chance of working? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess it could work. Uh, I don't know if that's the best thing to 
best place to store uh, binary documents, right, to be honest. Yeah, yeah well, I know that's, that's uh, strange, but uh, I got an idea for uh, for an internal project uh, where Elasticsearch basically covers all my needs for uh, storing data, except for binary attachments. So I just, I'd like to just store them along and... Um, I, d I don't know, to be honest, I've not tried. And so when you, I know when, obviously when you send those attachments, to kind of in, analyze them, but I don't know that you can actually retrieve them that way, but that's not to say you couldn't do it with, uh, that there aren't sort of properties that you could do that with, so. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. <laughs> so. Cool. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs>